Hello, and a very warm welcome everyone to our today's webinar on challenges and solutions, development and validation of Epitacep biosimilar clinical assays. I am Vragi Chandeli, and I represent VEDA Clinical Research. VEDA Clinical Research Limited, together with its subsidiary BioNeeds India Private Limited and its joint venture, Ingenuity Biosciences Private Limited, together referred to as VEDA Group, offers a comprehensive portfolio of clinical, preclinical, and bioanalytical services to support innovator, biosimilar, and generic drug development programs of our global clientele. Together, we serve clients globally in pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical, agrochemical and industrial chemicals, herbal, nutraceuticals, and medical devices industries. As a facilitator today, I'd like to introduce you all to a couple of points as we begin this session. This session will have a presentation in the beginning and followed by a live Q&A session at the end. We have also enabled our ask a question feature. It's right on your screen, wherein you can drop all your questions related to this webinar. Now, moving forward, I would like to introduce you all to our first panelist and presenter for today's session, Mr. Wildemar Kavalo. Mr. Wildemar is a bioanalytical principal investigator at Somru Bioscience Canada. He is responsible for the design, development, and validation of innovative bioanalytical assays to support biosimilar and biologics development. He played a critical role in the development of an ultra-sensitive immunoassay platform enabling femtogram level analyte measurement in biological samples. He earned his PhD degree in chemistry in the analytical division from the University of Alberta, Canada, where he conducted research on the development of analytical methodologies using polymer-based optical sensors. Our second panelist for today's session is Mr. Shahid Hassan. Mr. Hassan is the global project manager at Somru Bioscience. He's responsible for team representation and project management responsibilities, supporting cross-functional R&D and CRO projects at Sumbu. He completed his master's in engineering and he is experienced in managing geographically dispersed teams in North America and Asia and dealing with project complexities Complex. with time zones, languages, and cultures. So without any further delay, I would like to virtually call upon our first panelist, Mr. Wildemar, to begin this session. Over to you, Mr. Wildemar. Thank you so much for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here today. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the challenges and solutions in the development and validation of Abadacept clinical assays. Um, here is an outline of my presentation. Um, first, I'm going to give you an overview on Abadacept, its structure, mechanism of action, and characterization as it is really important to understand them so we can develop effective clinical assays. And then we will jump into the challenges and solutions in the assessment of Abadacept clinical assays, um, including PK, ADA, and NEB, taking into account regulatory considerations from the FDA and EMA when developing those assays. So Abadacept, I shown here in this figure, um, it is a soluble fusion protein that consists of the extracellular domain of human CTLA-4 linked to the modified FC portion of the human IgG-1. Modifications to the original sequences of the human IgG-1 gene were introduced to avoid unattended disulfide bridge formation and to reduce the ability of complement activation. Um, structurally, uh, Badacept is a glycoprotein 
with a molecular weight around 92 kilodaltons, composed of two identical subunits, covalently linked by one disulfide bond, and it is produced by recombinant DNA technology in a mammalian cell expression system. Abadacept's mechanism of action, I shown here in this figure, is to prevent T cell activation by selectively binding to CD8, CD86 receptors on antigen presenting cells, displacing the other natural ligand CD28 expressed on T cells. So the interaction between the CD28 and CD86 is required for full T cell activation. Therefore, this blocking action by Abadacept deprives T cell from an important core stimulatory signal, leading to suppression of T cell activation. Abadacept was first approved by the FDA in 2005, um, while IMA approved it in 2007 in Europe for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. The patents on the originator product exp expired in the US in October of 2019 and in Europe in December of 2017. So there is a lot of focus going on right now on developing Abadacept biosimilars. Abadacept car characterization is not really the focus of my presentation here today, but I would like to point out that the FDA and EMA guidelines for biosimilar development um, recommends a stepwise approach where the next steps are highly dependent on the findings of the previous step. And as you know, um, the first step in the biosimilar development program is the physical, chemical, and functional comparability studies. And it will determine whether in vivo non-clinical studies like animal work will be required or not. So if your characterization, if your characterization package is strong, is good, um, you can skip any animal work but for that, in addition to the traditional physical chemical characterization, which a lot of sponsors seem to focus on, um, you do need to spend more time on doing functional characterization. Um, this table here lists some of the quality attributes and the corresponding analytical techniques used for comparability studies. As listed here, IntelliB stands up among all those technologies because it offers compatibility studies of a number of quality attributes, such as higher order structure, post-translational modification and glycosylation profile, and in vitro functional bioactivity. And it does that in a single platform using the whole abadacept molecule which is highly recommended by the FDA and EMA. Um, in principle, um, IntelliB is an antibody array containing a number of FC receptors, a number of lectins, and hundreds of antibodies targeting different epitopes on the drug, on a bad set, to provide a fingerprint-like profile for comparing the innovator to the biosimilar. So now that we discussed a little bit on the mechanism of action and um, the structure of a set, we can jump into the clinical assay development. So I'm going to start with the um, PK assay development. Um, and in here, um, the right selection of the assay format is extremely important to avoid issues later on on the clinical trials. So your assay should be robust enough to support the whole biosimilar program, including preclinical pre clinical if you need, and all clinical phases. Um, here um, are three examples of PK assay formats that we haven't seen. Um, 
in the first example here, we have a capture antibody targeting the FC portion of a bile sept and the detection antibody targeting the CTLA-4. In the second example, we have both capture and the detection antibody targeting the CTLA-4. And in the third example here, we have a capture antibody targeting the CTLA-4 portion and the detection antibody targeting this FC portion. So all these assay would work for non-clinical work, like and also when you using normal ser human serum. But when you go to the patient population, so here we're talking about a bad set. And in those patients, they have high levels of rheumatoid factors and IgGs. And we have seen significant background noise and variability on the measurements for these assays that targeted the FC portion of a bad set. So in here, we do not recommend those assays. Once, um, once we select the right assay format, then oh, we should start um, testing and looking at uh, the critical reagents. And that's exactly what we did. So initially, we evaluated three capture antibodies from two different sources, um, including monoclonal and polyclonal antibodies. And the results for them are displayed here in this graphic. So as you can see, um, for capture antibody 3, we had a lot of background issue, while for capture antibody 2, we had no signal. But for capture antibody 1, we had low background issue, and we could see those response, but those signals were significantly low. So what we decided to do was to continue assay with um, capture antibody 1, but doing some assay optimization. For that, um, in this case, um, we vary the, its concentration, um, we increase the coding um, concentration, and also tested a solution phase. Um, where the reaction between the capture antibody and the Badacept is performed in solution, and then the immunocomplex formed is captured on solid phase. So still, um, the signals were significantly low. So we went back and started thinking on what could be the cause of such high cross-reactivity for the capture antibody 3 that we saw. And so we tested different blocking agents, in total four. And the results for that um, testing is shown here in this um, table. Um, as we can see, um, among all of them, um, the blocking agent C showed the lowest background noise and a good signal. So moving forward, we tested that on the assay. And the results are showing in here in this graphic. Um, in this case, we also extended our calibration curve. So going from um, 400 to 2.5 nanogram per mil, and also tested the tolerance of the assay in the presence of CD28. Um, as you can see, the signals were high with low background noise, and the presence of CD28 had minimal effect on the assay performance. We also carry out some selectivity studies and a mini accuracy and precision test with, again, an extended calibration curve. In this case, going from 800 to 5 nanogram per mil. So the results are shown here in this graph and in this table. Um, we could obtain a range of 20 to 800 nanogram per mil with a linearity up to 400 nanogram per mil. Um, when we look at the QCs, the results for the QCs, we can see that the percentage CV and buyers are all below 20%. So, um, with that, here are some um, take notes for Abadacept PK. 
um, it is extremely important to design an, an assay format that is robust enough to support the entire biosimilar life cycle. So uh, the, uh, the assay should work through all the clinical phases. And this includes testing your assay in disease matrix early on to account for future issues. Um, so we are talking about Abadacept and these patients have high um, levels of rheumatoid factors. So characterizing the USA in those conditions is really important. This will save you a lot of time and as, as you won't need to redesign and revalidate your assay. Also, um, you should know well um, your critical reagents. So know um, the binding epitope where it is targeting. Is it the FC, is it is the FAB or hinge portion? Um, know the stability and ensure supply of the same reagent. And also take into account the batch to batch variability. Um, finally here, plan early. So don't leave it um, for, uh, don't leave it for uh, when you want to start clinical trial. So this assays require some time for the development and validation. So planning early is really important, specifically if you have to do preclinical trials. Okay, so now um, we can start talking about immunogenicity assay development. So in the case of Abadacept, it is a very, very special case. Um, immunogenicity here is really important as antibodies to CTLA-4 could have adverse impact on patients because CTLA-4 is normally expressed in normal T cells and it has an important function in the immune system. So neutralizing antibodies to this molecule could prevent its activity leading to uncontrolled immune responses. The development of clinical immunogenicity assay for Abadacept is very challenging. Um, in general, immunogenicity testing should be performed using the whole Abadacept molecule. However, testing for antibodies to the whole Abadacept molecule is co-founded by the high level of pre-existing antibodies to the IgG region, particular in rheumatoid arthritis patients where rheumatoid factors are presented at high levels. Also, um, immunogenicity assays lack sufficient drug tolerance to evaluate all time points for anti abadacept antibodies. So the innovator had a lot of issues um, when they were developing the immunogenicity assay. And in their case, they used two assay approach, where one assay they used the whole molecule and the other one they used a truncated CTLA-4 form of it. Yet, um, they face a lot of issues with background drug tolerance and poor sensitivity, which adds the risk of missing antibodies against the uh, new determinant that rise from the nature of the fusion protein. To overcome all those challenges, um, we took extra care to develop in-house a method to minimize interference from pre-existing antibodies high rheumatoid factors and improved drug tolerance. So the steps for the assay is shown in this figure here. It is based on SPEED method, which stands for solid phase extraction with acid dissociation. Um, SPEED method is a plate-based uh, method that involves extraction of ADA from a solid phase bound to biotin drug that utilizes a double acid dissociation steps to improve the assay drug tolerance and to overcome a specific bind from pre-existing antibodies and rheumatoid factors as well. So we also have generated highly specific positive controls for the assay. Um, 
This graph here, it shows a comparative studies of a similar method used by the innovator with our speed method, where we tested a number of negative control setup. As you can see, um, the speed method showed significantly less background noise compared to the um, innovator um, similar method, um, which resulted in a less than 100 nanogram per mil of assay sensitivity compared to the original sensitivity of 540 nanogram per mil. This table here summarizes um, the challenges and solution in the development of ADA for Abadacept. I'm not gonna go through all, uh, all of them, but I would just like to point out some. So um, the innovator used two assay approaches um, to um, overcome those high levels of interference. Um, in our case, we use a speed method to overcome those interferences. Um, we also developed um, in-house a positive control and also qualified it. Um, our com comparing the sensitivity of the speed method with the innovator, um, our sensitivity is 100 nanogram per mil, while the innovator is 540 nanogram per mil. And also, um, there was a lot of variability and background issues due to the um, rheumatoid factors present in complex matrix. So in this case, we used a double acid dissociation to overcome those challenges. Okay, so now talking about the neutralizing assay development, um, the NAB assay. The choice of NAB assay format needs to be assessed based on the risk associated with the drug and its mechanism of action. The FDA and immunogenicity guidance recommends the use of cell-based assays for the detection of NAPs, except when the drug's mechanism of action is a soluble target. So in this case, you can use competitive ligand binding assay. However, um, a better septic mechanism of action is to block the interactions between two receptors in two cells. Therefore, a cell-based assay is required. And this cell-based assay should also reflect this mechanism of action using relevant cell lines. Thus, we engineered two cell lines, um, a effector cell that contains a luciferase gene under the control of, the, of a IL-2 promoter which can be co-stimulated with the second cell line, which is the target cell, in the presence of a regulator, in this case, um, anti-CD3 antibodies. Um, this co-stimulation um, mediated through the interactions between the CD28 on the effector cells and the CD8086 on the target cells in combination with the regulator activates the IL-2 promoter, leading to increased transcription of the luciferase gene and increased in luciferase protein expression. And then the luminescent signals are measured using a luciferase assay system. Okay, so to make this a little bit more clear, um, this scheme here shows how the assay works. On the left side here, we have the antigen presenting cells having the CD8086. And on the right side here, we have the effector cell containing the CD28 and the luciferase gene. In the absence of a bladder set, these two receptors can interact with each other. And the effector cells um, increase its expression of the luciferase protein. However, in the presence of a badacept, this interaction is blocked and thus the effector cells um, does not express the um, luciferase um, protein. Um, however, in the presence of neutralizing um, antibodies to a badacept, 
um, the neutralizing antibodies will interact with the abatacept and allow these two receptors to interact with each other. And thus, the effect of cells were uh, increased the expression of the luciferase um, protein. Okay, so initially we optimized some of the assay parameters um, where we determined the optimal ratio of the least buffer to lysate to luciferase enhancer volumes. The results for that are shown in here. And as you can see, when using 20 microliters of the least buffer and 20 microliters of the lysate, we obtain better signals. And we used that parameters for um, our next assays. Okay, so next we carry out the assessment of the positive net controls. Um, in this case, we looked at monoclonal and polyclonal NEBs. Um, the results are shown here in, in this table, which also include the results for 10 microliters lysate, just for comparison. Um, and as you can see, the signals for the monoclonal um, control were much higher than the polyclonal one. And also, um, the 20 microliters of lysate gave us higher signal compared to the 10 microliters lysate. So I understand that um, for NABs, it is recommended to use polyclonals as it reflects more the actual system. But this exercise was just to determine the sensitivity of the assay, which is around 100 nanogram per mil. We also did um, some MRD assessment where we looked at um, four um, different MRDs. Um, the results are showing in here in this figure. Um, and here you can also see the CVs. Um, for a cell based um, assay, they are very good. Um, the MRD121 showed higher signals um, compared to all of them. And finally, um, we investigated the intra and inter assay qualifications. So this table here shows the intra assay acceptance results um, for three independent assays. And as you can see, for each assays, um, the signals were following within the critical signals, and the percentage CV and signal to noise ratio were also within the acceptance criteria. Um, now, this table here shows the inter-assay acceptance um, results. Um, as you can see, um, the average for the signals um, for three different um, independent uh, assays, the standard deviation for them, the percentage CV fall within the acceptance criteria and all of them passed. So in summary, um, abatacept is a multifunction complex molecule. And for the detection of neutralizing antibodies to it, a cell-based assay is required as per FDA guidelines and due to its uh, mechanism of action. Also, the assay requires multiple cells to reflect its mechanism of action, which also requires custom engineered cell lines. And similar for the other assays, um, your critical reagents needs to be well characterized. So in this case, you really need to know your cell lines and the positive controls. In conclusion, Abadacet clinical assays requires sensitive and robust PK and ADA assays, while for NEB, it requires a cell-based assay with high sensitivity. In addition, abatacept clinical assays requires experience and expertise in working with the innovative molecule to regulatory expectations. And we have a team of experts working with the innovative molecules and regulatory agents for a long time. The regulatory expectations on these biosimilars is always going up and they are always expecting better assays than the innovator with higher sensitivity and performance.
So you do need a partner that can not only develop these assays, who can understand the technical part, but also have experience with dealing with those uh, regulatory interactions. In addition to that, the critical, the critical tool of these assays are the reagents. So you need a partner that, aside from developing the assay and having the exper experience with the regulatory interactions, um, can also generate, manage, and qualify reagents for the whole cycle of the biosimilar development. And SOMRU is equipped to support our ingenuity partner. So SOMRU generates and qualifies our own reagents, and we are in a unique partnership with Ingenuity to support them with the reagents that are well managed and qualified before used. Plan early. Following regulatory expectations, um, these assays can take up to six months to be developed and validated. And here, my final message is your, biosim uh, your biosimilarity is really depending on demonstrating that the PK parameters like CMAX, Half-Life, TMAX are comparable. And this compatibility data is being generated by these assays. So they are really critical to your biosimilar approval. So if you have one assay that is biased to one of the molecule, then you are drawing conclusions based on analytical difference and not similarity. Thank you all for your attention and for taking your time to listen to me today here. Um, I'll be taking any question. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a wonderful, wonderful presentation, Will. Now we will move on to our uh, questions and answers round. Uh, my first question is uh, for you, Will. And the question is, do you see any difference in PK measurements between normal serum versus diseases serum? Over to you. Yes, thank you. Um, so we have optimized for the PK, we have optimized the assay to overcome any interferences from rheumatoid factors and high levels of RGG. So we have done extensive selectivity studies in disease population and we have not seen any difference. All right, thanks. The next question for you is, for ADA assay, what is your positive control? Over to you. Yeah, so for the ADA, um, we have developed a positive control in Rabbit using the Innovata Badacept. So this can be used for early stage preclinical and clinical work. We strongly recommend generating positive control using your biosimilar and use it as a positive control. Um, we have the capabilities to do it. So if you need it, please contact me. Okay. Um, my last question for you is, PK assay, what if you cannot establish the biosimilarity? How do you handle the situation then? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Um, we will do tests. Um, we will test the biosimilar during the method optimization. Um, and if we see any difference, we will systematically troubleshoot it to ensure that this is not due to, do, to analytical assay differences. Um, we cannot, uh, um, if we cannot solve it, our last option will be use two assays like the um, in Innovator did. Um, this is very time consuming and labor intensive. Um, we can discuss the details of, the, of our approach outside of these calls, but in most cases, we are able to establish the biosimilarity. Okay. Um, thanks, Will. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Will, for your active participation and also for uh, nicely answering most of our questions. Uh, my last question is for Shahid. Uh, Shahid, the question for you is, how early do we need to initiate the project with you to meet the timelines?
Hi, Shai. Can you hear me? Hey, Shai. Can you hear me? Hello, Shahid. So uh, Shahid is having some network issues, but I can answer this question for you. Um, so these assays, they require some time for the development and validation, especially if you are following the FDA and EMA guidelines. So normally we will need, um, it, it can take six months for the development um, and um, method validation, but ideally um, you should plan for nine months. Okay. All right. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Will. Uh, thank you for an amazing presentation and for nicely answering our questions. Uh, I'd like to take a pause over here. We understand that the session has kept us all well engaged throughout, but we will not be able to take any further questions at this point of time. But please be rest assured everyone that we will be sending the answers to every questions of yours via emails. Also, we will be sending across the recorded link of this webinar on all the registered email IDs. Lastly, I, on behalf of Vida Clinical Research, would like to sincerely thank you all for being here today and taking out the time to be a part of this webinar. I would also like to extend my gratitude to Mr. Wildemar for being such a wonderful presentation and giving us all great learnings today. We at Vida Clinical Research honestly look forward to host you all again. Till then, take care and stay safe, everyone. Thank you.